who I was going to be. But Father, I didn't. I was lost. And I'm so thankful for the life that you've revealed to me, unlocked for me, and led me down. I'm so thankful, Lord. And I pray that the rest of us, Lord, as we grow in our relationship with you, as we commune with you and do community with you, Lord, that you will just be patient with us, long-suffering, continued long-suffering with us, Lord, as we do our best to maneuver through our emotions and our feelings and our thoughts and this world and your voice. It's your voice, Lord God, that we need to hear every day. So, Father, we thank you for this opportunity that you've given us to be here tonight just for that reason. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. Oh, good evening, church. Martha kept saying good morning. Um, I know with everything that's going on right now, uh, it's hard for people to seek the Lord in times of hardship and what happened the other day and what we can do on behalf of those people is just continue to praise the Lord and show them how good he is. And um, if you'll just stand in worship or you can sit and just, you know, close your eyes and just focus on him. Ready? I see the King of glory coming on the cloud with fire the whole world shakes the whole world shakes I see his love and mercy washing over all our sins the people see the people sing Hosanna 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 in the highest Hosanna 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 in the generation rising up to take their place with selfless faith with selfless faith I see a near revival staring as we pray and see we're on our knees, we're on our knees, and Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the Hosanna, Hosanna. 
sing in that church. And Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. And Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. You may be seated. So as you can see, um, we'll do communion later on tonight. Um, you know, the whole world's talking about what happened in Texas, just down the road from us. And um, you know what? I was telling Annette earlier that it seems like when something like that happens, the darkness just covers everybody because whether you lost a child or not, all those who've lost child or children hurt painful. And so you think about another parent losing their child, your pain comes back and your emotions can come back. And it just overwhelms me to think that, that, that sometimes you have to relive that. And my heart breaks for you, for mothers. And I um, can't even imagine, I mean, I guess I can. I've walked a lot of families through tragedies and I've seen what tragedies do to people and the the mark it leaves on their lives, the, the mark it leaves in your mind, the trauma it can cause. PTSD is a real thing. But you know, it's, it's crazy because in the, in the book of uh, Exodus, when Moses is born, there's a prophecy that, the, that a prophet was going to be born, and so... The Egyptians went out and killed all the children born, all the male children that were born when, Jesus, when Moses was born. All, all the male children up to two years old, they threw them in the river. We don't know if it's hundreds or thousands, I don't remember, but, but it had to be lots. These were God's people. There was a Savior being born, even if Moses wasn't the Savior. He was, he was the deliverer, and he was born. God birthed him for that purpose, and yet his birth brought this death of all these mothers and all these families. And then when Jesus was born, all the babies up to two years old, male children were murdered, and their mother's arms were stabbed. They were just... They were just can you imagine? No, you can't. you can't. We can't imagine that. We can't imagine that. But that it happened. That's in our scriptures. Our Lord, for some reason, allowed it to happen. It's hard to make sense, right? It's hard to see a good God in that. That's what everybody's saying. That all the atheists and all the antagonists out there that are against Christianity, this is what they love. They go, how's your prayers working? How's your prayers working? Is prayers still working for? We've been praying one after another for these, and they're mocking us for praying to a good and God. Where's your good God at? What kind of good God is that? Those are legitimate questions. Those are legitimate concerns that the human race can have. Legitimate. But for those of us who've had an encounter with the Holy God, those of us who've met him, those of us who've experienced him, even though it takes our breath away, even though it confuses our minds, something inside of our spirit, in our hearts, somehow keeps you from falling over the edge. Because I've watched a lot of grieving family members over the years of lost loved ones. You always think, I don't think I can make it if I was them. But yet they're making it. It's because on this side we think that, but when you're actually the person going through the loss, 
of the loved one, you understand what I'm saying about how God can carry you and how God can come alongside of you and somehow comfort you in the darkest time of your life. I'm glad we're doing communion tonight. I think it's going to be, I think it'll be a different one for us because we live in some of the most terrifying times. Murders and killings and serial killers and mass murder. It's been happening for ages. This is nothing new. The only thing that's new about this is that we, because of the media, we hear about it so quick and we're real time. It's real time and it catches us. It's one thing hearing about it a week later. It's another thing when you see it happening. But it also makes all the other parents who still have children feel bad. And it robs them. When my son graduated in 2015 and his best friend took his life in the parking lot the last week of school, it, 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 we, we couldn't even fathom. We couldn't, couldn't even know what to do, what to say, where to go, how to act. What's, what do we do now? Do we have graduation? Do we not? Do we just cancel graduation? What do we do? Because these kind of things hit hard. They hit hard. And um, it's dizzying. And me, because, because I'm a pastor, Man, I was weeping last night. I was crying last night. I was thinking about all the mothers, as, as, as many I'm sure you were as well. But I was thinking about all the counselors that are going to have to try to walk these families through that stuff and what that's going to be like. The funeral director, what that's like for the first responders, all those people, what that's like to witness that. Yeah, man. We have a good God, even though we don't understand him. He's good, Lisa. He's good. Just don't always understand. But we read his word, and we try to listen. We try to listen for things that help clear things up a little bit. Just a little clarity. So here's a little clarity. All those children are safe. All those children are safe. The human side of us is left behind to deal with, deal with. That's life. That's part of life. Just like those mothers in Moses' day and those mothers in Jesus' day. They had to get over it too. They had to move forward. And get, not get over it. I, I, I don't mean to say that. Move forward. Just move forward. Move, move forward just until it's your time to go into his arms. And so I just want us to know that our only hope is to mourn with those who mourn, to weep with those who weep, and to pray for those that are hurting. That's, that's, the, that's the most we can do. And then... In, for us, we're going to try to just go down there and, and probably not even feed any families, but just the first responders and just show the community that, that we're there to do what we can, even as small as it may be. Let's look at 1 Kings chapter 9 as we move along through Solomon's life. And, 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 and even Solomon's life is a very sad disappointment to a great start, to, to a great hope of having somebody that God can just really lean on to be the leader he's supposed to be. David was that leader. Even when he sinned with Bathsheba, he came out of that doing the right thing. He came away from that trying to do better and understanding. But Solomon is going to worship other gods. He's going to worship other gods. He's going to allow his wives to worship. He's going to do the exact thing God told him not to do. Don't marry all those wives. Don't marry all those women, those foreigners. Don't marry those foreigners. He does them all. First King chapter 9. And again, and it came to pass when Solomon had finished building the house of the Lord and the king's house 
and all Solomon's desire which he wanted to do. Now, it took Solomon seven years to build the kingdom. That's funny because seven is, is a complete number. And so it took Solomon seven years to build the kingdom, I mean, to build the, the temple of the Lord. But it took, it took him 13 years to build his own house, which was bigger than the temple. And I think what the Lord is showing us already is Solomon is getting too comfortable in his position and somehow slightly forgetting that God gets all the glory and Solomon is kind of building his own glory. And I think when you try to build your own house and you try to build your own ministry and you try to build your own style and you try to build all these things on your own, I think that tends to show that it's probably more about you than what God's trying to build. And I remember this very early pastor is, is, is thinking, I don't want to be led by the offerings every week. I don't want to be controlled by what money comes in, the offering. And I don't want to pass the offering plate because if I pass the offering plate, I'm going to have to say something about the offering. And if I say something about the offering, maybe my fears will show up in what I'm going to say or my concerns or my flesh are going to feel like it needs to squeeze you a little bit and make you feel bad or something. And, and I just said, I, I don't want to be led by that. I want to be led by you, Lord. And so we bought the boxes so many years ago. First, it was a mailbox when it was just a small church. But we just put, so that God could lead us and build the house he wanted to build. We didn't borrow money from this build, for this building. God gave us the money for this building. We, we, we've never borrowed money to build anything. We haven't put ourselves in debt to try to make, create God's house. We've let God build the house. We've let God, we didn't borrow money to build any of the buildings in the back. God built the house. He uses people to provide, but God has built the house. Your life, your marriage, your, your, your life, everything about you, God wants to build. He wants to take care of it for you. Solomon, he went a different direction. But here's, here's, here's how good God is. That the Lord appeared to Solomon the second time, as he had appeared to him at Gibeon, remember the first time he appeared to Solomon? He said, Solomon, you're going to be the king. What do you want? Solomon says, I want wisdom to lead your people, Lord. I just need, I need, I need wisdom to be fair in my justice, Lord, to rule your people, Lord, which every one of you should be asking, Lord, for wisdom to be a good mother, good father, good employee, good friend, good person, <laughs> And the Lord granted him that and all these other things. Remember it says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and all and his righteousness and all these other things shall be added to you. Solomon is the perfect example of that. He asked for the kingdom stuff. And God gave him all these other things. And the Lord said to him, I have heard your prayer and your supplication that you have made before me. I have consecrated or set apart this house which you have built to put my name there forever, and my eyes and my heart will be there perpetually. Those are two great things. He's watching and he's loving. If, now, now, it's, now here's, the, here's the conditions though, and these conditions apply to us to a certain degree. Now, if you walk before me as your father David walked in integrity of heart and in uprightness. Now, see, that's hard to think about when we know what David did. But listen how God remembers his sin no more. That's why David says, you make it white as snow. You blot it out like, like snow. Because David experienced the true total forgiveness of the Lord. And so the Lord can truly say to Solomon that David was upright in integrity. To do according to all that I have commanded you. And if you keep my statutes and my ju judgment, you've got to pay attention to all the ifs. That I will establish the throne of your kingdom over Israel forever as I promised David your father saying, you shall not fail to have a man on the throne of Israel. But... If you or your sons at all turn from following me and do not keep my commandments and my statutes, which I have set before you, but go and serve other gods and worship them, them then I will cut off Israel from the land which I give, have given them 
and this house which I have consecrated for my name, I will cast out of my sight. Israel will be a proverb and a byword among all the peoples. And as for this house, which is exalted, everyone who passes by will be astonished and will hiss and say, why has the Lord done this to this land and to this house? And then it says this, they will answer because they forsook the Lord their God who brought their fathers out of the land of Egypt and have embraced other gods and worshiped them and served them. Therefore, the Lord has brought all this calamity on them. That's what's going to happen if they get off track. And we know because we read ahead, they're going to get off track. Almost a thousand years earlier, when the Lord gave the law, he says the exact same thing a thousand years earlier, almost eight, nine hundred years earlier. He says some of the same things. If you walk in my statutes and keep my commandments and perform them, then I will, then I will give you rain in its season. The land shall yield its produce and the trees of the field shall yield their fruit. Now listen, as Christians, we have a certain responsibility to live behave a certain way, right? Is, I mean, that's right, right? We have, a, we have, a, we have a, a call to live and think a certain way. So whenever your mind or your ways contradict the ways that we know, we should expect trouble, Right? We should expect trouble. How many of you have known somebody, went to church, stopped going to church, and all hell broke loose in their life? How many, how many have you ever seen stop going to church and their life just went whew, way better? I haven't met any of those yet. Does that mean if you get out of God's will, he just casts you to hell? You just lose your salvation? Look. The last thing God wants to do is send you to hell. The last thing he wants to do. When you read all these testimonies of the Lord, you're going to realize that his greatest character, or the, the, the best part of his nature is, the, is the, the restoration part of his nature, the redemption part, the grace part, the bringing you back, the calling you back, the chasing you down and trying to bring you back. That's God's greatest characteristic that I think. He even says your threshing shall last to the time of vintage and the vintage shall last to the time of sowing. You'll always have food to be working with. You'll have so much food in the spring that it'll carry over into the fall. You'll have so much from the fall it'll carry to the winter, from the winter to the spring. You'll always be processing where some people are sitting around waiting for their crops to produce. Yours will just be plenty. In 2020, when all the churches were shutting down and we were hearing reports and churches looking for money and help and firing people and laying people off, we prospered. We, 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 we humbly prospered during that time. Financially, resourcefully, our resources grew, our food pantry started kicking off and it's just been a wild ride. For I will look f on you favorably. Now, this is, all, this is if you do your part. If you walk in those statutes, you'll do all these things. You can go back and read this. And then he says this, but if you do not obey me and do not observe all these commandments... And if you despise my statutes or if your soul abhors my judgment so that you do not perform all my commandments but break my covenant, I also will do this to you. When he, when he, when he reads this, when he speaks to Solomon, he says in verse 4, Now if you walk before me as your father David walked in integrity of heart and uprightness to do according to all that I have commanded you, and if you keep my statutes and judgments... Then I will establish the throne of your kingdom over Israel forever, as I promised David your father, saying, You shall not fail to have a man on the throne of Israel. 
when Solomon hears the Lord say that, Solomon is in the best place of his life. He just finished the palace. He just finished the tabernacle. He just finished dedicating it to the Lord. He just seen the glory of the Lord. He, matter of fact, in, in verse, in chapter 8, he's saying, as he's praying, he's, he's telling the Lord, when anyone sins against his neighbor, and he, he gives him a way out. Then he says, when your people Israel are defeated before an enemy, and he, and he prays the way out. Then he says, when the heavens are shut up. And so he knows that sin can come in and cause God should stop the blessing, but I guarantee you, when God's giving him this warning right now, he's not thinking he's going to break these laws because he's in the best place. But if the Lord is warning Solomon when he's sitting in the best place, we also have to be careful when things are going good for us and we read certain warnings. Like, for instance, years ago, years ago, I was in a men's Bible study group at our old church. And I remember the subject came up about men committing adultery. Christian men, preachers, pastors committing adultery. And, um, and thinking, I never commit adultery. And then as we talked, we go, you know what, I'd be careful saying that. I'd be careful saying I'd never commit adultery. You know, don't put yourself so confident in your, in your, in your, in your, in your integrity. And so we, 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 we all agreed that we all should say we all could commit adultery. It's in our nature to commit adultery. And because we know that, we're not overly confident that we won't. And so what we do is we live our lives knowing that we stay in certain positions not going, well, I can meet with her. I can meet with that guy. I can, I'm going to be okay. I'm going to be. <laughs> Amen. There was a pastor who did that very thing. He had been in the news lately. He preached the message. And when the message was over with, he did an altar call. When the altar call was over with, he did a confession. And he confessed that over 20 years ago, he committed adultery. And he confessed to his church. He committed this adultery. And the people clapped for his, because he was honest to be, he was forgiven. So they clapped for him to let him know they encouraged him for being a faithful pastor. Even though he did that, he was confessing. But then right after that, a girl and her husband came on stage. And she said, it wasn't 20 years ago, it was 27. And it wasn't adultery. You raped me. She was 16, took her in his office, and he, he didn't rape her, rape her, but he used his position, he used his age to manipulate a 16-year-old girl, lost her virginity. She's confessing this to the church. Now, they shut the cameras off, but other people were filming. She said, I lost my virginity in your office at the age of 16, and then because he, would, because he, they, he tried to save face... They convinced her not to say nothing to nobody, even had her participate in a purity ring ceremony. Can you imagine this girl getting raped by the pastor who's doing the ring ceremony, knowing what he did to her, not just once, several times, because she fell in love with him. So he broke it off, right? Listen, you know, I, 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 I was praying when I heard that. I was saying, Lord, I, I'm thankful not that I'm not perfect, because I'm not perfect, but I'm thankful, Lord, that you protected me in these 20 years of being a pastor. I remember, very, I remember very early on realizing that if somebody says, hey, be careful, that I trust it's the Lord telling me, be careful, because not that oh, I'll be all right. Not to have that arrogance and that cockiness because I'm a good Christian and I read my Bible and I'm a pastor and I do Bible studies or things like this. We're all capable of horrendous sins. That's why we're continually reminded of the consequences of our life and our life actions. It will come back on us. It will come back on us. It's a shame in this life that there's things like that. But this is what the Lord says. I will do this to you. I will even appoint terror over you, wasting disease and fever, 
which shall consume the eyes and cause sorrow of heart. Remember when we were reading about the man of God going by the widow's, the woman's house and then he told her she was going to have a baby and she had the baby and the baby died. Her son died years later and, and, and the prophet said, he, he, could, he, he, know, he said, something's wrong with her. She has sorrow of heart. And, and I realized that sorrow of heart is what all those mothers are feeling and families are feeling who lost children last night. That's what sorrow of heart is. That's, that's what the Lord is saying. He is going to bring that kind of disaster on people, man. I'm not saying that he's going to give it the same way to us in the New Testament as he did, he did in the Old Testament. This is what he told his people in the Old Testament. And then he says, if you continue on, if you do not obey me, it'll get worse, is what he says. But then he says this, but if they confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers with their unfaithfulness in which they were unfaithful to me and that they also have walked contrary to me and that I have also walked contrary to them and have brought them into the land of their enemies. If their uncircumcised hearts are humbled and they accept their guilt. As Christians, we don't really have to have guilt as Christians. But if you stumble and fall, you're going to feel bad. If you lie and cheat, you're going to feel bad. The Holy Spirit is not going to be pleased with you if you cheat, rob, or steal from somebody. Hopefully the Holy Spirit will move on you to do the right thing after that. Confess. Humble yourself. Do the right thing. That's, that's our Christian nature. That's our Christian character. Even the Lord tells us how to, he said, if, if whatever's in your ability to do, get along with everybody else. Whatever's in you to do, you do it to get along with everybody else. How sweet and, and wonderful it is when the brethren dwell peacefully together, the Lord tells us. He, he, he's, he's telling us that we have to push past our feelings about people and stuff sometimes. Just to do the right thing. To do the right thing is not always easy. But he makes great promises to us if we do that. He, and he says, and it shall be that if you earnestly obey my commandments, which I command you today to love the Lord, your God, and serve him with all your heart, with all your soul, then I will give you the rain. He says he will make sure you're blessed. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. I'm going to come back to that. What I wanted to show you is this is Solomon's empire. If you see in the red, it says the territory of Israel before David became king. That's all they had got. That's as far as they got since Joshua is right there, just in the red. But then once David showed up and David got in there, then he got more of the land. Once he became king and God gave him victory, you see how it started spreading out. And then the, the, the bright yellow... You can see how far Solomon's kingdom. But the interesting thing is, that's not all the land that they were promised. This is all the land that they were promised. Look at all these nations that are in the promised land. Kuwait, Jordan, Israel, Lebanon, Syria, parts of Iraq, parts of Saudi Arabia. That tells you they would, they would be the most lucrative country in the Middle East had they stayed in their proper place or in their lane, they would have accomplished all these things. They would have had all that. And so here's what I'm going to tell you tonight before we take communion. We also have the opportunity to have more than you can imagine in your life. Some of you are feeling shortchanged tonight. Some of you feel like you've not gotten all that you think the Lord could have given you. I've known men who come up to me and tell me, you know, I had a friend, a plumber years ago when we first started Calvary Chapel, he came up to me and said, man, I feel like I'm called, you know, pastor. And I said, well, man, you just don't go do it. <laughs> How do you do it? Well, you just start getting a Bible study and getting a couple people to listen, and if you do good, they'll come back. 
And to this day, he's still not done it. I've known several people who've said, I feel like God's called me to missions, or I feel like God's called me to here. And that doesn't necessarily mean he has done those things, but I think when you feel like he has and you haven't done it, you feel like you've sold yourself short. You feel like you've sold yourself short. So what I'm going to tell you is, is, is from this point on, you don't have to look for the big things that God wants you to do. Like I told Annette today, I said, you know what, Annette? Your calling is what you do in this church. That is your gift. That's what God has called you to do. All the interaction with the church, the administrative stuff. That is why God created you. I know that. He's like, he created me to do administrative stuff? Yes, because the administrative stuff opens the door for the spiritual stuff. It, it, it opens the door for every other thing we do here at the church. And I'm so blessed to be around people that have given their lives to, to what they believe God has called them to do. Listen, from here on out, Let's get the territory allotted to us. Let's get the territory that God has allotted to us and don't sell it short. Don't sell yourself short by being selfish and ugly and mean and all these different things that will rob you from having all that God has for you. Be a giver. Be a supporter. Be a lover. Forget. Be all the things that you would want Christ to be. What I want to be is the pastor that I would want somebody to pastor me to be like. And I know I'm not the best one. I know I've heard a lot of feelings, and I, 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 I want to apologize. I did not mean offense to anybody who has a doctorate degree. When I was talking Sunday, I'll mention that again Sunday, but I am proud to have doctors in my church. <laughs> I wasn't trying to make a point. But I do want to say this, that I, I want to accomplish, and I don't even know what my territory is. I don't even know what my complete territory is, but I want to pray that I don't get in the way of limiting what God has promised me to have in this life. I don't want to miss what he's put on the table and leave it on the table. You ever heard that? Don't leave it on the table. So that's important for us to understand that God has given us a big territory, but our choices can keep us from occupying all that he has for us. Amen. Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul writes to the Corinthian church. In the Corinthian church, he's addressing all these issues about a church. It's a great book to read if you want to learn about how a church should be. 1 Corinthians. But I don't mean you don't learn how a church should be from the Corinthians. <laughs> you learn it from Paul's instruction to the Corinthians because the Corinthians are getting it all wrong to a certain degree. But one of the things that he writes to the Corinthians is he, he writes to them, and it's interesting because communion was a fellowship of believers coming together, and when they came together, they would eat, they would have a good time, they would fellowship, whatever, but then there would come this time that they would do the Lord's Supper where they would do communion. But what would happen is they would kind of mix it in at the same time they were doing their food, and, and, and it was buffet style, so the people that brought all the food ate all the food. People that didn't hardly bring nothing to bring didn't get nothing. And so even in communion, they weren't doing it right. So he says, look, if you're hungry, eat at home and stay at home. Come to the Lord's table and do it right and honor the Lord's table. And tonight, I think for all those families that are hurting tonight, all those Brothers and sisters, mothers and fathers, grandmothers, grandmothers, aunts and uncles and cousins and friends and teachers and all the people involved in this last tragedy. I think we should thank God that we didn't have to go through that today. Because it may come tomorrow for us. But today, we can just say, Lord, have mercy on them, comfort them. Tonight, we're thankful for the communion we have with you, Lord. No matter how far away we've been, you're just right here. Just right here. Amen. He says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. 
For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. When we do communion tonight, one of the reasons that we do communion is to remind us of the resurrection. Because what communion did for us, it gave us the ability to have a resurrection. It opened the door for us to be resurrected. And so what a comfort it is in the end when darkness comes and your loved ones pass on to know that there's a resurrection, that there's eternal life. And that is what communion represents for us tonight, is the resurrection of Jesus Christ through the shed blood of his broken body, which he gave because we're sinners. Amen. So my workers will come up. If my acoustic guitar player will come up. Hey, girls, come on up. It's all right, come serve. About time. <laughs> you know, it's, it's crazy, not crazy, but it, it's, it's encouraging. I shouldn't say crazy. It's encouraging when the congregation wants to do communion too. It's very encouraging when people are asking us, hey, when do we do communion? When do we do communion? And uh, especially people that only come Sundays, I go, well, you got to come on a Wednesday night. You got to come on a Wednesday night. So anyways, um, I'm going to go ahead and pray. And then uh, you guys can go ahead and line up. And then we'll, uh, we'll take the communion together as you get back to your seats. Lord, we just thank you for this day. We thank you for communion tonight, Lord. We thank you for what it represents and we thank you for the opportunity you give us to participate in it, Lord God. And Father, I pray that this is as holy as you want it to be tonight, Lord. I pray, Lord God, that you bless this time that we're taking aside to do this in remembrance of you. In Jesus' name, amen. Y'all go ahead and come on up.